Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today during uh, 2020 CS Ed Week. Um, we are super excited to spend the next hour talking about data. Um, okay, okay, I get everyone's not as excited about data as I am. Um, but today I'm excited to be joined by my three colleagues and inspirational partners in CS Equity Work to talk about the central role that data plays in the ways in which we close equity gaps and think about diversifying computer science in California. My name is Allison Scott. For those that, that don't know me, I am the CEO of the K4 Foundation and also co-director of CS for California. And I would like to quickly ask my colleagues to introduce themselves. Next slide, please. Julie, we'll go with you first. Great, thanks so much, Allison. I'm so happy to be here. My name's Julie Flappen, and I am the director of the Computer Science Equity Project at UCLA Center X. And I'm also the co-director uh, with Allison of Computer Science for California and work with the Coalition on Advocating for Equitable Access to Computer Science Education in California. Thank you so much, Julie. It's a pleasure to work with you. And Brandon, would you like to go next? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Allison. And, uh, thank you to everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Brandon Nicholson. I'm executive director of the Hidden Genius Project. Our mission is to train and mentor black male youth in technology creation, entrepreneurship, and leadership skills to transform their lives and communities. Um, certainly, I think excited about data. Also, just a you know, reminder that data take uh, many different forms and shapes. And uh, so we're excited to talk about uh, multiple points of data uh, today, um, but uh, thank you for letting me be here. Thank you, Brandon, for joining us. And thank you for all of the great work Hidden Genius has done all over these last few years. And Sam, welcome. Thank you, Allison. Uh, I'm Sam Berg. I'm the computer science coordinator for Oakland Unified School District. Um, and excited to, to talk about data and and how we use it for the rest of the day. Thank you, Sam. We're so happy to have you here. And Sam has been absolutely inspirational in um, changing the, the trends in Oakland Unified, which he will be talking about a little bit more today. Next slide, please. So for those that are of you that are new to CS for CA, we are a multi-stakeholder coalition. Uh, we work to ensure equity and access to high quality teaching and learning opportunities in CS education in California um, and, and specifically prioritizing low-income students, students of color and girls and those who have been often left behind in computer science. So to reach our goal um, of ensuring that all students have access to high quality CS education, we have to understand what the current landscape is, uh, where disparities by race and gender exist and how to ensure programs and policies can address these gaps. Next slide, please. So for our conversation today, I will provide just a quick overview of the landscape of CS data in California, and then we'll get to our panel discussion where we'll hear from both, both Brandon and Sam um, about how data is used to inform community programming um, and programming at the district level. And then we'll hear from Julie about how data has been used to inform state level policy here in California, um, and then talk a little bit about how you can use data for action in your local communities. And then we will end with some Q&A. So next slide, please. Next slide. So I'll spend a, a few minutes talking about um, the landscape of computer science education at the state level in California and where we see existing equity gaps. And just a quick note, these data were collected from the California Department of Education and from the College Board, uh, where we looked at the availability of CS courses and enrollment in CS courses by demographics like race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, and rural versus urban areas. And as with any data, uh, we've learned quite a lot about the limitations and we'll cover those a little bit later. Um, as you can see from this first chart here on the left, uh, we've actually seen a pretty significant growth in access to CS courses over the past three years, but we still see that 61% of high schools in California do not offer any CS courses and fewer are offering AP CS courses. Next slide, please. And when we look at the course availability by demographic groups, we see that schools with predominantly students of color and low-income students are much less likely to offer CS courses and three, times three to four times less likely to offer AP CS courses. Um, we also found that rural schools were much less likely to offer CS courses. Next slide, please. So 
Okay, sorry. Um, and we did see some evidence when we looked at trends that um, some schools and students are being left behind. If you think about the overall trends and growth in CS expansion, uh, schools with predominantly students of color have actually made less progress in expanding CS access, um, which are actually widening gaps. Next slide, please. And in terms of enrollment in computer science courses, only 3% of our 1.8 million high school students are enrolled in computer science courses, and just 1% are enrolled in AP CS courses. Next slide, please. And we see that this AP CS enrollment has actually improved um, over time, in fact, quite significantly overall, um, if you look at the top trend line. Um, yet we can see clearly that the groups that are experiencing more growth than others, um, if you look at the red line, which is Asian students versus the yellow line, which is black students, there are pretty significant differences in, in growth um, and in participation overall. Next slide. So what we're left with are pretty significant equity gaps um, across the state of California. So we see that female students are underrepresented in every CS course. Um, Latinx students are also underrepresented in every CS course relative, relative to their population in um, in the high school population, um, and Black students are underrepresented in AP CS specifically. So these data don't necessarily paint a complete picture. They give us some insights into positive trends and also remaining challenges in ensuring racial and gender equity um, in computer science in California. So now we are excited for this conversation to kind of shift from the state level, which provides this broad overview um, and to be joined by our two guest panelists who are working at district and community levels to improve equity. And they'll have an opportunity to tell us a little bit about how they use data, some of the promising practices and existing challenges that they are seeing. So welcome, Brandon and Sam. Thank All right. You. I'm going to invite Brandon to kick us off. If you could tell us a little bit about Hidden Genius Project and maybe one win that you'd like to highlight um, in your work to bring CS to, um, to students of color. Sure, so uh, our organization, the Hidden Genius Project uh, was founded in 2012, um, really uh, by a core group of black male technology entrepreneurs who wanted to inspire uh, young people, uh, you know, who look like them to be able to engage in much of the work they were doing, um, but also who wanted to empower those young people as leaders and then provide them with tools they could leverage uh, to, um, you know, realize their potential. And so I think in short, we at the Hidden Genius Project are very much in the youth empowerment business and in the leadership development business, first and foremost. Um, and when we look at technology, computer science included, it's a uh, means far more than it is an end. Um, and that having been said, uh, I think our success has uh, centered on that core philosophy, our ability to actually engage young people in computer science learning um, has very much uh, been anchored in our youth-centered and assets-driven approach. Um, and so we have a core program, a very intensive 15-month, 800-hour program. Um, whereby we've served, uh, you know, roughly 270 young people since our inception uh, in that program and, and, you know, have seen great results with, um, you know, high school graduation rates north of 95% and um, post-secondary education enrollment rates north of uh, 90 to 95% depending on the year and um, our program retention has remained north of 95% between 95 and 98 um, at any point in time. So we've been really excited about that. Um, we also continue to do a great deal of engagement uh, with uh, communities outside of our you know, primary population um, by way of our uh, you know, single exposure events. Um, shameless plug for our Brothers Code event in partnership with the Cape War Center this Saturday. Um, uh, on Saturday, except, uh, December 12th, uh, will be virtual and that we can drop a link in the chat at some point, um, but also having partnerships with community organizations. And what's been very cool about all these this work we've done, and through this work, I'll say we've reached you know upwards of seven thousand young people, um, you know across the country, across the world, even. Um, but the way we've been able to do that work is really to elevate the young people from our intensive program as leaders in their communities and, and train them as youth educators and facilitators to facilitate facilitate our program. Um, so that's been, uh, you know, a, a great boon for us. And I think it ties into the larger theme um, 
for sure. What I will say is that, um, you know, it all starts with creating and making meaning for uh, young people first and foremost, and, and leaning, you know, especially with us working with adolescents, really digging in and leaning in on their interests first. Um, and so these young people are uh, not, you know, here to fulfill our dreams, right? They're here to fulfill theirs. And I think, you know, computer science education and our approach therein very much has to reflect that uh, reality as well. Uh, the last piece I'll mention um, is Sam and Oakland Unified School District have been a great partner of ours for sure um, and a great ally. And when we look at Computer Science Education Week and what it's meant for Oakland Unified, you know, Sam and his team and his forebears, they have very much been extremely collaborative and engaging in allowing us to be creative, to try and, and engage a broader population in interest in computer science. And still that having been said, uh, it's probably a bit alarming uh, that the Hidden Genius Project probably accounts for a probably a greater proportion of uh, the black male uh, AP computer science test takers throughout the state than what you hope, <laughs> you know, with our program being so small and having served 270 young people through our intensive. Um, but I think, you know, back of the envelope math suggests that probably in a bad year, we might be accounting for 3% of black male AP CS test takers in a given year, and possibly as high as 5 7 or 8%, um, which speaks to the need, obviously, obviously for some great uh, systems change there as well. Thank you so much, Brandon. It's really, I mean, knowing the program and the ways that you expose young people to technology and careers, I think is a really excellent balance um, with the work that Sam does, as you mentioned. So Sam, can you talk a little bit about your day-to-day -day work as a CS district leader and how you're working on changing systems so that those students that Brandon works to inspire um, can enter into uh, CS pathways? Yeah, so I'm the computer science coordinator for Oakland. Um, I, I, in my day to day, I, I'm <clears throat> working with teachers to try and set up the program, talking to principals, advocating for program, helping do curriculum work, um, pro professional development, all of those sort of things. And one of the things that um, leads me into this conversation is is how we think about data and what we've done for this. So. Um, when we launched CS, one of the things we really wanted to be aware of was like, we didn't want to replicate what the tech industry already looked like. We wanted to make sure we were going to give it to give opportunities to students who have been traditionally shut out of computer science opportunities. And so um, what, one of the things as we, as I look at the data and we think about enrollment, we've grown a tremendous amount in the last five years is who's enrolling in our classes. And so I'm looking, I'm looking at an enrollment data and I'm bringing it down into subgroups and saying like, are there enough, are, are, are girls disproportionately enrolling or un, not enrolling? Does our black, does at a school, does the number of African-American students in CS match the number of African-American students at that school? And so tracking that, and then based on that sort of data, reaching out to counselors, principals, and, um, and saying like, here's, here's where the numbers are. Let's think about some ways that we can either recruit more students or um, see, talk to, talk to students about like what's making them not want to take those classes or, or excited to take those classes and see if we can replicate that across the board. Um, last year with the KPOR Center, after looking at some of our data, we put on an event for counselors where we pulled some resources from National uh, NCWIT, the National Women in Computing uh, Organization. And, and so we, we had some conversations with counselors about like, there's not enough girls enrolling in these classes. What, what are some things we could do? And, and then at a couple of schools, we saw some real changes in terms of the number of girls that wanted to enroll or when they, when they, a counselor told me when, when a girl comes in and says like, I want to drop that class or I'm not sure about that class. Now she has some stuff to, to um, have a whole conversation with them about it and keep, and keep them ex excited and engaged. And so that's, that's a little bit, one of the ways that we use data sort of as, um, as, as a computer science coordinator in the district. Thank you, Sam. And I forgot to ask you to highlight um, one exciting element or data point about uh, your work in bringing CS to all students. And I think I, I think I know what it might be, but I'd love to hear. What I mean, I, I think the thing that that really stands out is is the amount of growth we've had. So five years ago, computer science was offered in two middle schools to eighty kids, and now it's in all the middle schools in Oakland, um, which is eleven, and we're serving about eighteen to nineteen hundred kids a year, and so. Like that's been a, a crazy amount of, of growth for us and we're really proud of that and at the same time trying to be really aware of making sure that those the, that those kids that are now getting this opportunity um, represent what our schools look like um, across the board. 
Amazing growth. Thank you, Sam. Um, so this question is for both of you. Um, as we think about the data that was presented on a statewide level, we know like one of the things that we're missing is we don't have a lot of um, rigorous data on the experiences of students, the interests of students, um, the things that inspire students, the things that are demotivating to students. Um, can you talk about how your work, we'll start with Brandon, can you talk about how your work with students um, impacts how you might think about student level data collection? Sure, and I think, you know, for my money, this is the most important component of, you know, the data pertaining to young people's engagement and students' engagement in computer science education. Um, the why has to be, you know, crystal clear for each young person engaging, and you heard Sam speak to that, you know, we, in this space, um, and, and so many of us on this call, not just on the panel, but so many, you know, you all joining, I know, you know, we're meaning extremely well. Uh, we want to make sure that our young people have even greater access to opportunity to learning, to develop skills, you know, quote unquote, 21st century skills, you know, uh, knowledge economy skills, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that having been said, a lot of us fall into sometimes what you might you know, consider to be the trap of speaking about opportunity in terms of what's available, in terms of what's missing, um, you know, uh, usually, and, and we have to be very careful about the power dynamics and uh, of, of speaking in that way as well, just because in communities of privilege, we tend not to speak about what young people in those communities can do as a function of what's going to be available in the year 2030 or 2040 or what jobs won't be filled. Uh, you know, we tend to speak in terms of dreams and strengths and passions. You know, when our child is too short in communities of privilege, you know, to play professional basketball, we don't say sports is unrealistic. We say, have you thought about writing about sports? Have you thought about, you know, building sports related apps? Have you thought about being an agent? So on and so forth. And so what technology does, what computer science education affords us, it's the opportunity to help young people imagine themselves uh, as leaders, as, you know, uh, subject matter experts, as uh, uh, innovators in any number of respects, but centered on the stuff they already love. But that having been said, oftentimes the engagement of communities that are not typically getting access to computer science, communities of color, girls and young women, et cetera, um, a lot of times the, the narrative centers on, well, you know, you need this so that we can fill these jobs or your best shot at getting a job. But I don't care if you're talking about adolescents in high school, if you're talking about middle school, even young children, that tends not to be the most compelling way to engage anyone, right? To inspire them, try something new. So I think the question we usually pose in the way we approach this is, you know, the, the very first data point is, let's just talk about what technology is, what it can do. Let's talk about how each individual already engages technology, um, be it computer science or anything else. You know, we're trying to problem solve at the end of the day, right? We're identifying implements to solve problems where the problems that matter to you. You know, whether you want to be a chef, uh, you know, a fashionista, uh, whether you love sports, whatever it is, tech is driving all of these things. You know, we you know, are based here in Oakland, the Bay Area, um, you know, and right in the middle of COVID-19, you're not going to sell a whole lot of food out of a brick and mortar, um, you know, uh, establishment right now, right? You're certainly going to have a really hard time starting one today. And so what, what are folks doing? You know, they're doing pop-ups, they're using technology, they're taking orders, they're doing deliveries, they're using delivery apps, et cetera. Technology is driving the, you know, the food you know, space, the restaurant space uh, and business uh, you know, significantly right now, right? So, you know, if, but it, at a certain age, if I'm only hearing, you know, you could be the next Mark Zuckerberg, you could work at some company that does something that seems to have nothing to do with what I'm interested in, then it, it's not, uh, those are the first data points I'm getting around whether computer science education could be something that's quote unquote for me, something I can access. So we really try and challenge ourselves, our partners, our families to start with what do our young people love and start digging into the various ways that technology might apply to that thing. What do they see in their environments, et cetera. Um, and that becomes the first step to at least build the interest to make the case because we can sit here and develop a great plan to then offer AP computer science at, you know, 51% of schools, 48% of schools in the state, uh, or sorry, 61, 85, you know, keep rising. From, I was going the wrong direction. We want to get from 60 up from 61, but uh, that's not necessarily going to create meaningful engagement. And you saw Allison highlight that interesting gap where you're seeing um, some more access among schools, but not necessarily increased engagement 
um, uh, with you know communities of color, um, and obviously we do a lot of work with uh, black students among others. And so um, you know for us, you know it's uh, it's it's not easy, but it's also not rocket science. It really starts with coming uh, at our young people and, and working with them from an assets based perspective. Thank you, Brandon. I think that's a really helpful. Um... I, one of the really helpful points that I got from that is some ways that data can be used in the wrong ways. Um, and I think our colleagues at CS for All, Rafi Santo has published a paper on the why of computer science and oftentimes the framing of why computer science should matter to students is either on the disparity side, we're trying to close gaps or on the available jobs. And I think what you're highlighting is by just framing it as something interesting and relatable and, and something that they might be interested in could actually increase student engagement. So. Thank you for that perspective. Um, Sam, I think similarly, you talked about how um, you are really working to empower teachers to collect student level data to try to get at some of these very topics. And so I'd love to hear how you um, get student level data, how you think about using student level data inside the classroom. So I think I'll, I'll back up for one, one second um, before I get to student level data and just talk about, well, our district-wide student level data before we get to classroom-wide student level data. So Perfect. we've given the students a student survey about their attitudes about computer science, how they feel about it. This computer science feels like it's for people like me. This feels relevant to my life. I feel empowered in these classes. These are some of the questions that we've asked. Um, <clears throat> and then what we wanted to do is like, based on, on what's happening with that data before the students take the class, after the students take the class, like <clears throat> who's, who's that, who's the, who are these classes working for and who they're not working for? Um, and we've now, thanks to um, Sonia from KPOR Center, we're able to break that down onto a student by student basis. So the hope is once we're out of COVID, we'll be able to do focus groups and say like, you said that this class, you didn't feel very empowered by computer science. Now you feel very empowered by computer science. What happened in there to do that? So we can talk to teachers about, about that data. So that's our next step after, after we come out of all of this, um, we go back to school for real. And then what, what we're trying to build on now is, is sort of what Brandon was talking about is like, we have this data, we see that it's, some students are very connected with it, some are not. And so as teachers, we've done a lot of professional development around survey your students, talk to them about what they care about, what they're passionate about, what they're interested in. And then let's look for opportunities inside our curriculum to let them have moments where they do that, um, where they get to express or do or show these things in a way that's like, I made this thing, I use technology to do this. And this is something I really care about. It's not something that came from the book, but it's something that came from, from the heart in that way. And so we're starting to see like, as we get teachers to look at that data and come up with ideas and projects and open themselves up a little bit more um, that are the, the students are feeling more, computer science is more relevant to them. They're feeling more empowered in those things. And so that's an exciting step that, that um, we've been working on recently to try and do um, some of the stuff that Brandon has been talking about, about thinking about where kids are coming from and what they what they want out of these classes. Thank you, Sam. I think that's a really great uh, point. And I think both of your points together are inspiring me as a researcher to think about how valuable it would be to have um, kind of like publications or resources for other teachers and for other schools to think about what, um, not just what's inspiring students, because that's obviously very context specific, but how to go about determining what's inspiring students and how to get them meaningfully engaged in computer science. I think that would be hugely huge and valuable to all of us. Um, so one other follow-up that I had related to um, students and data is when we think about the disparities in CS education um, that consistently show, you know, that Black, Latinx, and Indigenous students and girls are less likely to participate in CS, how do we ensure that the data don't reinforce stereotypes about ability? And I think this is kind of what we're talking about now. Um, maybe it's in the framing of our of how we talk about computer science, um, but would love any thoughts that you you both have about that. How do we ensure we're not reinforcing stereotypes through data? Uh, well, I can just say, Allison, that my Wi-Fi completely cut out right as you were asking the question. So I'm hoping you can re record it. I, I'm sure I just broke all sorts of rules of like maintaining the, the veil and what have you, but yeah, I'm gonna need you to help me out there. Oh, no problem, Brandon, no problem. I was just saying, um, you know, our data that we consistently report on shows disparities by race and by gender. So how do we ensure that that data is not reinforcing stereotypes mm -hmm. 
one of the things you talked about was like in messaging, like we obviously don't yeah. want to lead with young yeah. people yeah. with that messaging. Are yeah. there other ways that you've found in conversations with students um, to ensure that that data is not having a harmful message? And reinforcement? We also just have to do data better, right? And, 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 you know, integrate data more holistically. So um, this is no disrespect, no shade to K4, this, you know, C, CS for CA team, et cetera. Um, you know, one of the data reports and there's multiple iterations of them that I see get, you know, utilized like very sparingly are any of the Nielsen reports, for example, that speak to, um, that have been done particularly around young people, millennials and black young people and their role in technology. And so, for example, those data support, uh, you know, or the findings support uh, conclusions that uh, black youth uh, literally lead the world in early adoption of technology and, and social media engagement um, and content development and willingness to teach others about technology, right? And so those are very important uh, data points as well, right? Those are very important, uh, you know, uh, research findings that are not discouraging by any means. And so when you um, think about then how does that integrate into our pra practice, then we're engaging young people when we meet them regardless of their background, regardless of their age, we're certainly our primary population. We're saying, guess what? You know, particularly when we're talking to black youth, tech is what you do, right? What we're trying to do is afford you the skills and tools, you know, so you can streamline your ability to then do more, for example. But tech is what you do. If we keep talking about in forms of gaps, it's ignoring all these phenomena. And one of the examples I'd love to use you know, and people I'm sure get sick of it, but like, you know, we talk about all the roles uh, in a tech company or any company um, that involve technology. And then we, we use the data, Allison, as you mentioned, you know, to justify them why we're not filling them with, you know, rep in a representative fashion. And yet at the same time, you know, Popeye's chicken can sell out of the chicken sandwich, you know, a year ago, uh, basically entirely on the backs of a youth led technology driven communications and marketing strategy that was completely ad hoc, right? That completely was overwhelmingly driven by young people of color. And that was basically a joke. And so what that tells me, the data I get from that is even just playing around with technology, our young people can basically drive an entire marketing strategy for a brand that had no idea what it was doing, right? But because people came up with a few great jokes and pieced that together, you saw people using technology in these amazing ways. And effectively, they sold out these sandwiches. And you've seen this last year of like Popeye's like marketing and ads have been trash. Why? Because young people moved on to something else. And, and Popeye's didn't say, well, let's go ahead and like invest in the type of young people who would, you know, develop these skills and learn these skills to do more, right? Uh, and help us like build our strategy because they got the first one for free. Um, and what I would say to that finally is the piece I never want to ignore is, you know, those percentages of, you know, degree holders in computer science at different, uh, you know, universities and, and colleges, those are real people. So yes, they may not be rep representative and you may not be getting, you know, representative numbers where the proportion of degree holders matches the proportion of the population for any group. But if you're a 13% population and you're holding degrees at 5%, but you're getting hired at 1%, that's not the community's problem. The gap in there somewhere is in the hiring, right? The data are suggesting, if we're really looking at it, that you know we're constantly pathologizing the group. We're saying, is that the gap? But what's driving the gaps? We know access is one, but we're seeing people generations back uh, you know, who are still not getting hired and supported. My second computer we ever had in my house was built by a woman who at the time was a black woman over the age of 50, right? This was in the mid nineties, a black woman over the age of 50 named Jenny, who already had had a pretty dastardly experience with tech. That's in the mid nineties by the time she was 50. So you have people also who are doing this work and doing the degree attainment, getting the education and trying to advance uh, but they're still not getting engaged in a humanistic and meaningful way. And so those are data points we also have to pay attention to as well. Excellent point. Thank you, Brandon. And thank you for reiterating the focus on asset-based approaches and the, the example that you just described, and also the limitations of um, much of the data and, and the larger debates around diversity in tech. Um, so thank you for, for reiterating those. Um, Sam, anything you want to add on this point? I also got completely shut out of this. So I, I, I missed a lot of what Brandon said. Um, so I apologize if I'll talk over anything that uh, I, I hear, no but, problem. Um, 
I think the thing that when when we look at that data and it gets reported out, I need to I have to arm myself to be able to have conversations with folks with stories like the ones that Brandon is telling. So when mm -hmm. I go to a counselor and they're like, well, you know, like I'm like, how come no African American students are enrolled in this class? That <clears throat> they're like, well, see, no, no one's ever like the the African American students across California aren't enrolled in this class. Well, let's talk about why. And like let's talk about the the reality of like, you know, like is it scheduling? Is it is it something that's happening here? Like, let's tell the stories of some that have been successful to start to change some mindsets because I do worry sometimes when we post data up like that that some people in their mind can can tell themselves a story that then lets 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 us off the hook in terms of like, well, it's bad everywhere, so it doesn't matter that it's bad here, and we need to we need to be able to shift that and say like, what are we going to do to make things work for for students here? And so having some of those stories or, or some of the things that like Brandon has said, helps me as I'm having conversations with, you know, admin counselors, teachers, other stakeholders to say, let's fix this problem and not, not let's excuse ourselves because we're a little bit better than the statewide data or a little bit better than the nationwide data. Excellent point, Sam. And, and um, just a plug that I think you've been doing excellent work with teachers in focusing on our existing biases as part of professional development in CS. So moving like beyond just content into exactly what you're talking about and thinking about bias and mindset and um, kind of disrupting some of those stereotypes. Okay, so next question. Um, we started talking a little bit about the limitations um, in state level data. Um, and, and conversely, it would be great to have any ideas that you both have about what data would be nice to have and would help you advance your work? So this could be at the state level, but this could also be at the, um, the district or local level. For me, the things I think that are helpful are <clears throat> the, more, the more current the data is, the better it is for us. So when we're looking back at a couple of years ago, um, and, and we're feeling like a lot better than like, oh, well, way, you know, our percentage are much better than the rest of the state. Well, like some other people are caught up, but that data is two years old. And so maybe we're not great. And then the other thing that I really appreciate is the ability to sort of <clears throat> slice it in a lot of different ways. So can we look at African-American students who are on free and reduced lunch? You know, can we look at um, Latinx girls? And when we just report these large columns, um, it's sometimes harder to, to see like, how is that relevant to us? Who's being successful? Who's not? What 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 are the things? Who should we reach out to to talk to talk more deeply about these issues? So I always appreciate the ability to 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 dig um, pretty deeply into the data. And on that, I'll give a plug for the um, the data dashboard that that CS for CAA has put out because that's been really helpful to be able to look at different districts and different regions and see sort of what's happening there. Thank you, Sam. And I know my colleagues, Sonia and Laura, who are the data wizards, are uh, taking copious notes on that feedback. Thank you. Brandon, any thoughts from your perspective about what data would be nice to have and would help advance your work within Genius Project? Sure. I think uh, one of the great opportunities for us is to be able to heat map, you know, uh, uh, so pretty much everything Sam said already, and also just be able to heat map some of the phenomena we look at, like, you know, test taking, for example, right? Like, you know, in addition to enrollment, um, uh, certainly even scores. And, and so, you know, we've seen a lot of energy, you know, here in Oakland, the Bay Area, of course, and then we've seen more work happening throughout the state, but just, you know, I could just be extremely incorrect, but it seems as though, um, you know, much of the initial uh, kind of investments and in inputs have gone into say OUSD, SFUSD, and then you have other districts come along, LAUSD, San Jose, so on and so forth that are large, but then you have rural districts, small districts. Um, then I, I, I juxtapose that with uh, the shifts in population throughout the state, you know, owing uh, over the last decade, right, owing to, you know, displacement, owing to, um, you know, economic shifts, et cetera. And so, you know, it might turn out that as important as it is to have the strategy in OUSD, um, you know, Antioch Unified, right, is mm -hmm. potentially a hotbed of, you know, kind of uh, needs for advocacy, for example, uh, in, in the East Bay area uh, for to reach, for example, black community. So it would be great to even just be able to look at the map and, and, and align that or, uh, you know, kind of uh, overlap that with, you know, trends we're able to see around communities where they're living, et cetera. So. Excellent. Thank you, Brandon. 
Um, and, and I know we have a lot of questions in the chat, so I want to have just one last question for you both um, before we conclude the panel, um, which is what would be one lesson learned that you'd like to share with colleagues? So we have a, a range of different colleagues on this line, many of whom have already asked questions about things like data collection or work with teachers and counselors. Is there one lesson learned or one major takeaway um, around data that you'd like to share with them? Uh, maybe Brandon, who wants to start? Um, I think the most important thing, and I, I know there's even a question around, you know, how, uh, you know, we might engage, you know, parents and other community members. Um, the the most important datum we have is is what do our young people love, you know, and and, and what are they into, um, and being able to start there, uh, you know, I think we'll actually see shifts in data. And I know that's kind of a bit more kind of practice centered. But it, it's really, I think, the most important thing, you know, I, I say it because if I'm a parent, for example, and I get caught up in reading the trends or I read a report and I say, well, this got to change tomorrow. You know, I read this data and, you know, I'm going to, you know, obviously it would be tremendous as a parent to be able to advocate for a more robust advanced placement CS offering, you know, at my school or in my district. That's huge. That having been said, the hardest part of all that, as hard as it is to like work with districts and you know, can feel like slow and what have you. Um, I believe my hunch is actually harder to get your young person to get in there and stay in there over time again, if it's not what they want to do. So I think some of the greatest, you know, data will just come from our young people. You know, some people might be hearing them and say, you know, that's absolutely right. I'm going to do my next lesson on loops for young people in the form of a rep. That would be a potential miss unless your young people say, I would like to have my le next lesson on loops in the form of a rap. But right. you know, our young people's musical taste, for example, so varied and eclectic now and cosmopolitan, right? But we have to be able to listen and hear, get the information. What are the problems they're trying to solve? What are the problems they're already solving? And then find ways to build in and backfill behind that. And then you can advocate and say, you know what? My daughter uh, would love to basically uh, be an international electronic mogul and she knows that you know the licensing challenges around sharing music and sampling et cetera are what they are and she wants to build it xyz and, and and i think computer science can help her do this because she can figure out how to develop the platform to share her her music or you know license her work or get paid etc this way much in the way a bam camp is doing much in the way soundcloud has been you know that being inspired recognizing that these tools and platforms are what are driving these other realms and so that's the number one i think data point you need is uh what excites and inspires our young people and they're all going to be different um but when you aggregate them and put them together one of the the threads that can tie them together is technology is computer science education because it can put someone together who loves science with someone who loves uh fashion and someone who loves cooking and they can all find ways to coalesce and and uh, build solutions together beautiful thank you for that takeaway brandon sam do you have one last lesson for us yeah i mean i think the lesson that that we've taken away over sort of trying to do this work for the last five or six years is that it takes a lot of stakeholders and that each as we enter in with each group we think about what you need to think about what data is going to make sense for that group and i think the point that brandon just made of like let's talk about the the most important stakeholder which is the students and what do they care the most about and how do we how do we in how do we use that data as we're talking to admin counselors district leaders to to really help push this um this this to keep going and and keep getting better um and so you know like different data for different folks but it's going to take a lot of folks to make this happen um and so how and and think keeping students at the center of that and and thinking about their likes and their needs and that data i think is is really um is really the biggest takeaway i've had in the last couple of years thank you so much for that sam and thank you both for this very rich discussion. We have lots of questions that I want to make sure we can get to. Um, but one just quick reflection and takeaway from this conversation is how important it is to center student voice, um, student voice, teacher voice, counselor experiences on the ground as we think about then how to inform state level policy. And I know that's something that has been at the core of what CS4CA has done over the past um, 
five or so years under Julie's leadership. So um, thank you for your input. Please stick around for the Q&A. There's lots of, um, lots of questions in there. And with that, I'd like to transition over to my co-director, Julie Flappin, to talk a little bit about how we've used data to inform state level policy over the last few years. Thank you, Allison. Leave it to you to make a conversation around data really, really exciting and engaging. And thank you to Brandon and Sam for your insights and sharing the work that you're doing and the really important questions around wrestling with data. I mean, with every, every good data point we have, we also struggle with some of the pitfalls. And I really appreciate the opportunity to think about what's missing here but I also think this conversation is such a perfect illustration of what our theory of action is in the efforts that we are making to diversify computer science education. And so what we really do is take all of these lessons, like in this conversation, what is going on at the local level? What are practitioners, what are the challenges that practitioners are facing? in expanding access and engagement in computer science. And so how do the local voices inform the policy at the state level? And um, how do we ensure that the policies that we're advocating at the state level aren't creating un unintended consequences and further barriers, but really support that local implementation? So there's this real dynamic reciprocal process really uh, with equity at its core. So we're asking questions around unintended consequences. Well, what if we get a computer science teaching credential? What will that mean for other, uh, other teachers? Or if we integrate computer science, if computer science is its own discipline. So we're using data that informs all of the policy that we're working on. And by that data helps us identify where these gaps are and where we really need to focus in on policies that interrupt the existing inequalities that we see in schools. So at the next slide, we will, um, next slide please, we'll, we have, this is our, our timeline of how we've been working in this space and in particular in California using research and data that informs policy. And really every time we speak with a decision maker, whether it's at the local level, an instructional leader, um, a policy maker, they always say, ask us the first question when we talk about problems with equity and access in education, the first question is, what data do you have to support that? So a lot of our work, and, and I'll get to it in a minute, the, the work that um, Allison and her colleagues have done at Cape Core Center is create this amazing equity data tool that allows us to search by district, by, by uh, at school level district or county, and even zip code to find out where are those equity gaps at a local level and how do we use that data to inform policy. And some of the big issues that we have, um, I think, really been successful in marshalling that data. One is uh, using data to inform the statewide strategic implementation plan for computer science. And what's unique about our strategic implementation plan in California is it specifically addresses issues around equity and access. And a lot of that is informed by the data. The other um, big um, advancement, I would say, is getting computer science standards approved in California. And there are a lot of folks probably on this call who are part of that um, initiative and really focused on how do we provide equity and culturally responsive curriculum and an equity pedagogy in the way that we administer and um, talk about computer science standards. And, and then the third is around professional learning and how do we support teachers that are um, either teachers of color themselves and um, or are serving students in low income communities of color and how do we prioritize funding for professional learning. And so we have been working, uh, we have 
been working on getting funding through the governor's budget and through different uh, legislative proposals, all using the, equi the, the data to inform those policies. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, we've, we've also been wrestling with what some of the, um, the pitfalls of data are. And so we have prepared a data brief that we're releasing today called Measuring What Matters. And it talks a lot about highlighting some of these sticky points around data and some of the unintended consequences when we release these reports and what's missing and how can we further illustrate both assets of students, but also um, other areas that we can go deeper into the data beyond what we typically gather. So one, some, some highlights of this data brief, one is the need to collect disaggregated data, which we had talked about, um, clarifying what we mean by computer science coursework and going beyond just college board AP data, but really looking at entry level coursework um, as well as um, the many different kinds of courses that are integrated with computer science. And then um, I think this came out loud and clear was the, the need to include, include qualitative data so that we can really understand teachers' experiences and students' experiences. And so on our website on cs 4 ca we highlight the work of many of our colleagues, including um, Jean Ryu, from UCLA, who's also doing a lot of research around student engagement. Um, and so I encourage you to, to, to go and look at those videos of student experiences as well as teacher experiences, which really helps um, illuminate what, what the experiences are of folks who are working in computer science education. The next slide, please. So five actions you can take to advocate for equitable CS. And I think um, one is the data tool and that is available on our website where you can identify what, um, who has access to computer science education. And um, the second is how do we use that? And this came up, I think in the questions, how do we use that data um, to advocate and inform? And so by, going online and seeing where, where those gaps are in your local community, you can use that data to then present to your school board, to your instructional leaders, to write letters to elected officials. Um, and so that can be a really powerful uh, calling card to build, um, build support for CS education. You can also use it as a way of building power and connecting with local community-based organizations, other parents and families, and um, so that you're not alone or that you see, you know, this isn't just my school that isn't providing computer science education, but I'm beginning to see trends and there's, there's systemic patterns around who has access and who doesn't. And so we encourage folks to use this data and connect with other organizations that are already doing advocacy around equity and access in, in schooling and add this on. Um, another, another suggestion would be to use this data and include it in local school accountability plans. Um, and so this data is really accessible. And then the last two pieces are really just to join us in our work in um, the cs for ca coalition. As Allison mentioned, we are educators, we are higher ed folks, K-12 policy advocates, industry people, um, all working together in coalition to put continue to put pressure on the system to increase equity access and student engagement in CS. So we put out a newsletter, we tweet quite a bit um, at cs for ca and then I'm just going to leave you with the last slide before we move on to Q&A is um, a shot of our searchable data tool and um, shout out to Sonia Koshi and Allison and Alexis Martin and all of the um, amazing people at K4 Center. Um, and this is our searchable data tool, which is also available on the website. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Roxana Haddad, who's been collecting 
questions in the chat and we'll help field those. And I think we have a few minutes to, to respond. Yeah, the first question is for Sam. Um, uh, this person said that it was great to hear about your work with educators and counselors. Can you speak to your work with parents and caregivers and the role in supporting their child in computer science? So what we've, what we've tried to do is think about how we can, one, engage parents and caregivers early and let them know that computer science is an opportunity that exists. And so we're working on reaching out to fifth grade students right now to say like, hey, this is something that's happening in middle school. And um, we're, even, we're even asking fifth grade teachers to target students and be like, who do you think would be great in computer science that doesn't know that yet so that we can reach out to their family and tell them like, this is awesome. Uh, your student seems special. Like, will you please sign up for this class um, as a way to do that? The other things that we've done, um, like when we started, when computer science got started before I came on here, um, one of the things that happened was with uh, Claire Sherall, who was in this position before me, worked with Brandon and Hidden Genius, and they brought students from all the high schools in Oakland. They trained them on how to uh, do an hour of code and then also advocate to a principal to, to ask for a CS class. So then they brought those students, those students all ran an hour of code at their high schools. And then they went to their principal and said, we really need to offer CS at this school. Like this is something that we wanna do. Um, and that really started to help catalyze that um, ball rolling in terms of like getting more CS classes added. So those are a couple ways in which we have um, reached out to families, reached out to um, caregivers to say like, your, your, your student can do amazing things in CS um, and can you help us do that? And what we found is a, a lot of folks can call a principal, you know, like the district people could say, you should add this class. But when parents call like that, that's another level of advocacy and people listen to parents often um, in a way that, that they might not listen to uh, like me, for example. Brandon, do you have anything to add about um, working with families? Certainly, I think, um, you know, Sam, I appreciate you mentioned the example going back to 2015 now, we had the first uh, young people, including some of our geniuses, lead, you know, our code. Um, and, you know, what we built on from there was also making sure that just uh, young people and families alike understand what all is available to them, you know, having arguments with um, young people, then, you know, the next year who said, hey, I tried the hour code, I didn't like it, tech isn't for me. And then going back and saying, well, what are you into? And they say music and music is all about tech and having what was an in-person Brothers Code event, for example, and then encouraging that young person to come in or bring family and say, you know, connect with some of the people in the music business. In this case, uh, Dwayne Wiggins, uh, when the founding members of Tony, 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 uh, one of my favorite bands, but, um, you know, it's hard for for families, parents, guardians, you know, to have all the answers. Um, but just start with what's around us, you know, start with what we know, you know, and, 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 and start again with what, uh, you know, kind of matters to our young people and to us and, and go from there. And so I think when we started building out our Beyond series with Oakland Unified School District, thinking Beyond Code, it was all about trying to equip young people, families, educators to think about what's happening that relates to technology, and it might be even non-technical roles and opportunities that are in the technology field or a technology related role that's in something that seems not technology you know, driven at all. And so um, really just starting with that exercise and then from there recognizing the rest of all of it is just tools, right? It's not the end all and be all, it's just tools to get uh, our young people along a path. Great, thank you. Um, some questions along, uh, what plans are there to collect more current, excuse me, more current statewide data regarding accessibility to computer science within counties and districts. Um, this is for Allison and Julie. Unmute there. Um, yes, this has come up a bunch of times. Uh, the data tool, which we are super excited to have and shout out to my colleagues for creating it is um, getting a little outdated. So our goal is to ensure that we have updated data next year um, on the data tool and moving forward so that this way it provides an opportunity, as you said, for parents, students, district leaders, um, anyone to look at the data, um, not just on a statewide, um, you know, kind of aggregated level, but down to the, the county and the district and even the school level, which 
as you see from the overall data is where you'll start to see some really big disparities. So our plan is to continue to collect, um, to collect data and update that moving forward. Um, and then questions about um, what is the best way to get um, to translate data on DEI and diversity, um, equity and inclusion and translate that to actions that teachers and st stakeholders can take to address those issues. Do you want me to I'll, take I'll that? throw that to, to Julie. Sorry, I didn't name my person. There you go. Um, so I think, I think um, you know, Brandon brought up a really good issue about how we use this data. And Sam, and Sam did too. I think you both referred to this about how we use the data and how it's communicated. And rather than looking at um, the students as the problem, but really thinking, looking inside and saying, okay, what am I doing either as a teacher or as a counselor um, as a parent, what can I do to, to encourage my students to pursue computer science? And so one way is really just educating yourself and saying, okay, maybe I need to go to a professional learning opportunity and learn how, what culturally responsive curriculum is in computer science. How do I do, how do I engage students in something that is meaningful? Um, I wanna give a shout out to Computer Science Week um, with CSTA and that the, the theme this week is computing for social justice. And I think a lot of what, what we've been talking about is finding um, projects that are meaningful to students' lives and solving problems and particularly solving problems in with a social justice frame of what is meaningful in my community. And so how we do that, sometimes we just need a little help in learning what some tools and strategies are for how we implement that in our classroom. What was, was, was that the question? Was it? Yeah, I think you answered it. I think you did a good job. Um, but I think our time is up. So um, I'll leave it to you two to close this out. Julie, close us out. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so I want to thank everybody. I mean, this was, um, I, it's such an honor for me to work with Allison um, and Roxana and everyone at Cape Horse Center and all of our coalition partners in CS4CA. Everybody adds a different dimension and a different lens and perspective, and it really makes our work so much stronger um, in statewide policy and increasing equity and access in CS, making it meaningful, making it socially relevant, um, and helping students really become engaged and find their own sense of identity and agency in the world, since that's really what, what, we're, what we're really doing this work for. Um, so I want to thank everybody for doing your part and encourage you to join our coalition and stay informed with CS4CA. So thank you, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Brandon and Sam. And don't forget to attend Brothers Code or invite young people that you might know to attend Brothers Code this weekend. My nephews have attended and they loved it. Thank you. All are welcome to um, where we love our sisters as well and uh, everyone. So please join us here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.